Hey there, and welcome. It is so good to have you with me today. Today, we are going to talk about pupils and what pupils can add to an iris assessment. It's an important feature that you know we didn't even talk about. We didn't even know about it when I started iridology nearly 45 years ago. So I'm going to encourage you to grab your notepad and your pen and be ready to take some notes with us today. And also remember to use that chat box. Right. If you've got a question or comment, drop it in the chat box and share it with me so that we can have a conversation. If it's a question that fits with what we're doing, I will be happy to work it into the presentation. Not a problem there. Also want to remind you, for those of you who watch this on the replay, to please remember to like the replay, uh, share it with a friend, drop a comment, subscribe to my channel. All of those things help to make my channel more visible, and I really appreciate your help with that. Thank you so much. We will be talking again about, about pupils, but I'm also going to be talking a little bit towards the end of, the, of our time together today about the upcoming Dynamic Iridology Assessment System course for health professionals. So stay with me for that uh, because we're going to share some important course information there. Let's start with just what one of my, um, okay, there we go, but one of my former students has said, this is Trisha, and she said, I just wanted to say that as a new student has worked in iridology before this and is a certified iridologist through another teacher, I've learned more in the first two lessons of your dynamic iridology course than in all my previous iridology training. Yikes. Okay, so that's really good that she was learning so much in just the first two lessons and there's 20 lessons. But the fact that it's more than she learned in all of her previous training, that's almost scary to think that she was certified with that. So good to have Trisha in the course. I'm so glad that I decided to sign up. I know that after taking this course, I will be offered, be able to offer clients the best and most up-to-date knowledge. Love that. So really an important thing to understand that all not all iridology courses are, are created equal, right? So important. Just a reminder here that um, the information we're sharing is only for your education. We do never, ever, ever, ever diagnose or prescribe using iridology, and you're responsible for any results, good or bad, that result from using this information. All right. So here we have our first eye. So when we look at an eye to do iridology, we look at the iris, right? I mean, iris, iridology, that just makes good sense. We look at the sclera and we look at the pupil. And I want you to take a look at this pupil and notice it is not round. Can you see that it's not round? If you can see that, give me a not round in the comments box. This is important. So we know that the iris is genetic information. It's inherent. It is what our parents, grandparents, great grandparents, and great great grandparents blessed us with. Thank you, Andrea. I'm glad that you can see that it's not round. Fantastic. The sclera shows us very dynamically where the hot spots are, where are where the congestion is, where we need to be asking deeper questions, and it'll help us understand what the clients, why the client has symptoms they've got now. The pupil is a little bit genetic and a little bit situational. And so when we see this, there hasn't been as much research into the pupil yet as there has been with the iris and the sclera. But what we're finding with the pupil is that there are some very specific correlations that are situational. And then there are some tendencies that mean that there might be some inherited predispositions there as well. So as we look at these next few eyes, we're going to be learning some basic pupil studies. First thing we're going to learn is the word meiosis. Now meiosis refers to pupil size. And this is a really important thing to ascertain when you're working with a client. When we are assessing pupils, we never, no, let me rephrase that. If we see pupils that are very small like this, that is called meiosis or they are meiotic pupils. We would never in practice assess pupils as being meiotic from a photograph. Never do that from a photograph with meiosis, specifically meiosis, because when we're doing iridology photos, we use a lot of light. 
And of course, the pupil's response to light is to get small, right? Now, if we're looking at a pupil's or at a student, plug it in straight today. Um, when we're looking at a client's eyes in normal room lighting, if their eyes are this small, then they are definitely myotic, okay? If you're outside on a sunny day, sitting in a park and you're looking at somebody's eyes there and their pupils are small, you can't use that, right? Because that bright light from the sun is going to make the pupils get smaller. Does this make sense? That we only assess meiosis in normal room lighting. If that makes sense, give me a makes sense in the comments box. What we know, thank you, Andrea, I appreciate that. What we know about meiosis is that this is an indication of someone who responds primarily in the parasympathetic nervous system, right? They all, they're just always petting down the waves on the ocean. They want everything to be calm. They want to keep control of everything. And if everything is just the way they want it, if the spices are lined up alphabetically, if the cushions on the couch are just set up perfectly, then their world is wonderful and they can be calm. But if you take one of those cushions and put it in the wrong place, or if you mix the spices up or put a spice back in the wrong place in the spice drawer, there's going to be trouble. They are not going to handle that well. They like organization. And as long as things are organized, they can stay calm. And so they spend a lot of time organizing everything. They want everything to be organized. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? But it gives you insight into that person, that if this person's pupils are small in normal room lighting, you are going to be very, need to be very organized in how you present information to them. If you present a shotgun pattern and, you're, and you wanna pull it all together in the end, that's not gonna work for them. They're going to need A leads to B leads to C. This is the structure of how we're working through things, right? And that will help them to be happy. Do you know anybody who, who you've observed has small pupils in normal room lighting? Do you? And do you find that they like to have things very calm, very tranquil, but they like to be in control, right? Okay. Here's another example of meiosis. Again, we can't really assess meiosis from a photograph because the lighting will skew the size of the, the pupils. Um, and so, and that's especially true when we're shooting darker photos. How many of you have iridology cameras already? If you've got a, a proper camera, not um, a $300 iriscope, but a proper camera for iridology, give me camera in the chat box. Okay, so when you do get cameras, what you need to remember is that often with your darker eyes, you have to use brighter light, right? In order to see the details. So you're probably going to want to do a couple of sets of photos with your people who have darker eyes, one with less light and one with more light. And then of course you want to assess their pupil size in normal room lighting. Okay, so some old people, this is from Veronica, have meiosis. Is it normal for old people to have meiosis or it should be in young people only? No, it can be anybody. I mean, the, some of the older people that I know have gotten so laid back, like they do not give a care about what anybody else says. They're just going to go through the rest of their life doing what they want to do. And if you want to get in the way, well, just get out of the way because I'm doing what I want to do. That's also going to probably be a meiosis, a meiotic situation, right? Where they are, um, they're in control and they're not letting anything get under their skin, right? So it's not really more young, more old uh, necessarily, okay? So again, consider the amount of light that you are using. If you're shooting really dark eyes, then you're going to use a brighter light, but that's also going to shrink your pupil. So you're going to need to assess that pupil size in normal room lighting. Again, the smaller the pupil, 
the more likely um, these people are living in a parasympathetic nervous system control situation where parasympathetic is the rest, digest, sex, it's the relax, it's the I'm chill, everything is good. That's where these people like to be, but it's at a price, right? They want everything to be organized. And so when things aren't well organized, it leads to easy stress. So I want you to think back to your anatomy and physiology training to think about what would, what are some of the physiological responses to being parasympathetic? And what, what would that look like? What would that look like? So uh, really important to, to consider that. And Veronica is asking, is meiosis a genetic predisposition? No, this can change. This can change, right? And we're going to look at the contrast with this, Veronica, right here. So the other side of this is medriasis. Now, medriasis is large pupils. These are the eyes that when you look at them from across the room and you see their pupils are so huge, your first response is, what are they stoned on? Right. What are they taking? That's illegal or, or whatever. Right. I mean, we've all, I've got a daughter. These are actually my youngest daughter's eyes. She's now 25 years old. And as she's learning to cope with stresses better, her pupils are becoming more regulated, which is a good thing to see. So large pupils, really, really common in young children because everything about them, everything in their world is a new experience, right? So this is someone who lives in the sympathetic response, right? When, when you think of the sympathetic nervous system, what, what are the words that you use to describe that? There's some very common words. I wanna see that in the chat box. What are some common ways that we describe people who are having a sympathetic response? Let's have you do some lightning fingers and put that into the chat box. Fight or flight. Yeah, Andrea, absolutely. Are there any other words that we can add to that? Anyone have any ideas? You think of freeze and fawn, Morgan. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So those are the four that we associate with medriasis. So these are the people who respond to every crisis no, let me rephrase that. They respond to every event in life as if it were a crisis. A hangnail or a broken fingernail, major crisis, right? Someone looking at you cross-eyed when you weren't expecting it, major crisis, right? Um, real crises, like a serious car accident, that's a huge crisis, right? And so these, these people that are midriatic tend to function in the sympathetic nervous system. Because their pupils are so large, when you're using your camera, you're going to need to learn how to adjust the light in your camera because their pupils are open wide, which means they let more light in. And if you've got that bright camera light right there, shining in their eyes, it's going to be very uncomfortable for them. So you're gonna to need to learn to play with that a little bit. These people tend to be very generous. They literally will give you the shirt off their back, even if they have nothing else to put on. Like you need it more than I do, here you go, right? And so these people also tend to burn through their adrenals pretty quickly. They're frequently in a state of adrenal exhaustion where, and, and emotional exhaustion where they're just feeling depleted and they really need to be aware of taking, of, of being protective of their recharge time. They've got that increased peripheral vision, that pupil is open so wide that they literally don't have to turn their head very far to see the bear that's chasing them, right? And these people are always on the alert because like I said, everything is a crisis for them. Now I want you to remember too that this enlarged pupil can also be the result of you looking at somebody you really love. Right, as we are looking at someone we really love, our pupils expand so we can take in more of them. Right, and so that is that's a good use for medriasis, right? A really good use. So when we are seeing pupils, these are slightly medriatic, they're not as large as what we've seen. But again, this is a young man who has had uh, some trauma in his life and he has learned to be on guard. He's done years of counseling to learn how to not be so heightened all the time, 
to be aware of dangers and possible situations, but to also take that step back. Isn't it interesting? Same person, same camera, same day, same settings in the camera. Look at how one eye has so much more pigment than the other eye. Just an interesting observation, right? So when we see medriasis, when we see these large pupils, we know this is someone who will respond very intensely and acutely to stress. And it'll be things that you and I might not think are stressful. But for this person, it's a huge stress. So when you know you've got someone who functions that way, where they respond intensely to stress, what systems in the body do you want to support? It's going to make you lean on your anatomy and physiology and whatever other holistic trainings you've got. When someone is responding acutely or when you see they can, what do you want to support? Andrea, fantastic. I would support adrenals as well. One other thing that I would want to support in addition to the adrenals, anyone want to take a stab at it? The thyroid, not so much the thyroid here, Morgan, but that's a good guess. That's a good guess. Not all people who are midriatic have a thyroid concern, but they will almost all have some level of adrenal involvement and on a broader scope, the nervous system, right? And adrenals have it, that intense interaction with the overall nervous system. And so when I'm seeing someone who is midriatic, especially I am going to do some level of adrenal support with them. And whether I'm actually working with someone who's midriatic or meiotic, I am also likely going to include some kind of nervous system support because being too parasympathetic is as, as, is as much of an imbalance as being too sympathetic. Right? We want to find that happy balance in the middle as close as we can. Is this making sense? Andrea's saying yes. Fantastic. What I love about this, and Morgan is saying yes as well. Really excellent. And Andrea's saying very interesting. Wonderful. Do you see how this could help you initially? So a client comes in, maybe, maybe they're an established client, maybe they're a new client, whatever. They come into your office and you're doing an assessment, but you look at their eyes and you see their pupils are gargantuan. Okay, instantly you know that you're going to need to be a little more sensitive and supportive of them. And you're going to want to ask them, not just the casual, how are you, but how's your day going? What's been going on for you lately? What, are, what kind of stressors are you facing, right? If they've got the meiotic pupils where they're coming in really, really tiny, you're still gonna wanna ask them, how are things going? And um, is life going the way they want it to, right? You, you've got to ask the questions to figure out what's going on so that you can be more useful. And it's not that we're necessarily going to give a remedy for everything, but if we understand that maybe our client with the midriatic pupil has just been through a week long of budget discussions in their office and they're going to have to lay some people off. And it is this client's job to determine which people go. How much stress would that be? I mean, if you've got a real slacker, it's probably not hard to go, you know, you're, you're done. But if you've got some people who've been working really hard and it's not a matter of they're awful workers, but it's a matter of we just can't afford to keep you and keep the business viable, right? And you've got to make that tough decision. What kind of stressor would that be? And even just giving your client the opportunity to talk about that, even though it's not your area of expertise, giving them that safe place to just dump the trash, as I like to say, can often help to clear some of that energy. So now you can get in there and do some of the other work that you need to do. Does that make sense? It's one of the things that medical doctors don't have the time to do, right? So now that we've seen some eyes, we're going to look at a few more. So don't, don't disappear on me here, but I wanted to introduce myself for just a moment because some of you are quite new to me and some of you've been around for a while. We've got a student here who um, is actually one of my soon to be graduates of the course. So this is exciting as well. 
Um, I am Judith Cobb. I'm a master herbalist, natural nutrition, clinical practitioner, and one of only nine level three certified iridology instructors in the world. I got into holistic healing, started looking at it in 1979. I was home for the summer, had some health problems. The doctors couldn't put their fingers on it, on what was wrong, couldn't give me any guidance. I went back to university and, um, or, and at that same time, I actually met a fellow, a young man who just a really sweet, sweet young man, kind and generous and smart and funny. And he knew some things about holistic healing. So I went back to university. He and I had a long distance courtship. Um, we got married the next summer. And that's when I really started studying holistic stuff in detail. And I studied iridology under eight different teachers, three different styles um, and uh, herbology and nutrition, all kinds of things. So I've got all kinds of background. I've written and published several books, self-published, which means they're all out of print now, except for the textbook for dynamic iridology, which is only available to my students. Um, but I've taught biokinesiology and I was a certified prenatal educator and I've taught herbal courses. Um, I've taught lots of iridology courses in different ways, shapes and forms. And so tons of experience, broad experience that I share with my students in our classes, the way I share it with you in these mini classes as well. I'm a professional member of CanP and CanPro, which are two uh, national Canadian based, actually international organizations. They say Canadian, but they've got members from all over the world. Uh, and the Alberta Herbalist Association, also a professional member there. So as, as we talk about things, I'm coming from a really broad perspective, not just of iridology. I don't see how we can teach iridology by itself. I always have to integrate the nutrition, the lifestyle, the diet kinds of things with it, because if you're only looking for markings and you don't know what to recommend or how to recommend it, you're of no use. Identifying a marking is useless unless you've got a remedy for it. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Morgan says, probably smart to consider if people are stressed from talking to medical professionals as well, maybe an acute situation. Am I right? It absolutely is. You know, many of the people that many of my clients are, um, they've got doctor fatigue, if you will. You know, we talk about flavor fatigue where people get tired of eating the same thing over and over. Well, they get doctor fatigue. They get here in Canada, here in Alberta. Doctors have a sign on the wall that say, because we've got socialized medicine, right? They are paid per visit, not per problem, per visit. So you get to talk about one problem when you're there. If you've got three things you want to talk about, your doctor will make you make three different appointments on three separate days because they can only build a system for one, for one problem per patient per day, right? So they're tired, clients are tired of that for them to be able to come into an office, know that they've got a full hour, that you can do an assessment, you're going to listen to their problems. It, it makes them feel heard and it makes them feel understood and it develops rapport very, very deeply, which then develops trust, right? Oh, Morgan, you're in Calgary too. Fantastic. Well, there you go. Here I am. I'm in Calgary. We should connect. And Andrea is says it's frustrating in Texas as well. Yeah, that is, it's the way it is right now, right? Oh, I love what Veronica says. She's the, my student who's just graduating. I can honestly say Judith's iridology course is the best investment to be the best, learn from the best. Thank you. You're going to make me cry. Judith is the best instructor. The way how Judith is teaching you will, uh, will, be, uh, you will be pleased in many ways. Oh, thank you for that so much, Veronica. I really, really appreciate that. That, that. I'm gonna screenshot that so I can have it on my desk for a few days. Things like that are just really precious to me. <coughs> okay, so let's, let's move on. Let's look at some more eyes. So I think I can see now. Okay, there we go. Okay. What you will find is my heart's right here, right here. Okay, any lips? Remember I said at the beginning, not all pupils are round. Sometimes they look like they've been flattened on one side, but sometimes they look more like an oval. And so when we see an ellipse, so this is an, an ellipse and its axis is running this way. Can you see that? Can you see it's not really round, but it's more of an oval. 
and we've got a diagonal axis here. If you can see that, give me the word diagonal in the chat box. Okay. So when we see an ellipse, depending on which eye and which direction, it will often suggest an increased risk of bronchial issues. So in order to assess ellipses correctly, we have to know which eye we are looking at. And we also need to know which direction the ellipse is, right? So I would want more information. Now I know that this is a right iris. And because of that, this is then going to be um, an ellipse that is up to the right. And so when we see this, this is actually um, a fellow who is a type two diabetic. And the interesting thing is he's not willing to do any dietary work whatsoever. He believes that everything his wife is doing for his food is just perfect. He's in his late sixties, almost 70, and he's not willing to change anything. So when we see an ellipse going this way for this fellow, um, if we had two of them, it would suggest a risk of, I'm sorry, that's to his left. The, this is a right eye and it's a, a left flattening. My apologies for that. I sometimes have that little twist in my brain too. And so what that means is a risk of left-sided paralysis, sexual disturbances, lack of strength and energy in the legs. Well, if you know anyone who's diabetic and it's getting advanced, they lose the circulation to their legs, don't they? And so we're, we're kind of nervous about that with him. If he has, if, if both of his eyes are ellipses, if only one is an ellipse, again, we are looking at the more of uh, an increased likelihood of nervous asthma or bronchial problems specifically for him because it's pointing up to his left, it is suggesting uh, left lung, okay? Now we don't diagnose and we don't prescribe. But if the first question I always ask a client when they come in is, what would you like my help with? And then I do gather a bit of a history. I wanna know surgeries, medications, previous serious illnesses, anything running in the family. And if in any of that, I see any, any indication of bronchial, then I will probably bring this up with him and ask him about, you know, does he breathe easily? Can he get a good deep breath breathing to his belly, not into his shoulders? Um, you know, there's a lot of things we can ask to get it to kind of screen for lung. And if we think it's a serious enough condition, then we need to recommend that they see a medical doctor. Or we just need to add, dig deeper and ask them, would they like us to see if we can work on this symptom naturally, right? So we need to be careful if we're not licensed medical professionals, how we word things and how we approach things. Here's another ellipse. So this is his the left eye. And we've got the upward slope there again. Flattenings. So flattenings literally look like something squished and we get a flattened line. So instead of being all the way around, we'll see areas that are flat. So when we see areas that are flat, they correlate to different areas of the spine. When we see a flattening at the very top, like we do on this particular eye, this is someone where we are likely going to see more problems with their neck, everything from the atlas right down through C5. So when I see this kind of a flattening, I'm going to ask, do you have any neck discomfort? And if they say yes, I'll ask, you know, what do you do about it? Do you work with a chiropractor, an osteopath, a massage therapist, a physical therapist, what do you do? And are they constantly working on your neck? Right. And I'll usually find out that, yeah, they are. Or they'll say, no, I haven't done anything about it. I just live with it. Well, I'm not trained in doing physical manipulations of any sort. So I would then refer this person out to someone from my A team who I felt would be a really good fit. I might say, are you willing to work with an osteopath? 
you know, some gentle pressure and gentle manipulations, not, you know, maybe not the grab and grind that some chiropractors do. Um, do you, would you prefer to work with someone who works more with the energy of the spine to get things to align and relax and behave themselves, right? And so I will refer them out, but I understand where the problem is. I understand that we are looking at that upper cervical area. And then because of anatomy and physiology, I also understand what parts of the body that part of the spine sends nerve messages out to. So now I can look for symptoms in those areas that I might need to apply a Band-Aid for, right? I might need to do a herbal something to just make things comfortable while this person is making arrangements to go and get the physical work they need to have done. Emotionally, when we see the flattening at the top, we see more depression. We see more fatigue, more paranoia, more melancholy, and more guilt feelings. So there can be some personality things there as well. So we want to be aware of the flattenings to understand um, all the ramifications and how that can affect what the client is coming to see us for, right? We don't often get to um, get to see flattenings unless we're using magnification. Like you won't see this just usually from across the room kind of thing. You'll want to have a good quality camera and you want to get in nice and close and you want to be able to blow this up on a computer screen. This is a young woman, one of the eyes of a young woman who came to me, she was gaining weight. She was like 21 or 22. She was home from university for Christmas and she popped in to see me and she just really was gaining weight. And she brought in lab results that she'd had done over that same Christmas vacation where her doctor said, oh, you are menopausal at the age of 23. I just, I wanted to, um, I wanted to shake that doctor. I wanted to educate that doctor. A 23 year old does not go through menopause. That is likely polycystic ovarian syndrome, right? And she had all the symptoms of, you know, the weight gain, the menstrual cycles that were eight weeks apart, um, the facial hair, all the classic symptoms. So, and she wanted the weight gain to stop, which I had to share information about PCOS with her and say, well, I wonder if PCOS is the problem here. And if it is, then getting your weight under control the right way can help to rebalance your hormones and reestablish your menstrual cycles appropriately and protect your fertility because she was young, but she knew she wanted to get married in the future and she would want to have children. So when we look at her eyes and we are looking at these inferior flattenings that we've got down here, right? As we look at that, we want to see what we've got that attached to, right? So this is her left eye and this being her left eye, we've got this area flattened which is flattened against a pancreas zone and a, a pancreas and liver zone actually. And so when, when we know that, if you know PCOS, are you familiar with PCOS? If you are, give me PCOS in the chat box. Polycystic ovarian syndrome, is that ringing a bell for anybody? Okay, so PCOS is a complex metabolic disorder that affects women in the reproductive age. And what it means is that in most cases, the vast majority of cases, it means, well, a couple of things. The symptom is, the final symptom is a lot of follicles in the ovary that are not maturing, they're all stuck, right? And because they're stuck, they're forcing the body to stay stuck in the hormone production for that phase of the cycle, which can last months, if not, if not nearly a year or longer, right? And so what we know about PCOS is that it often starts with the insulin being spiked. So they're insulin resistant, which means they've had a high carb diet. They've created insulin resistance that that spiked insulin messes with their sex hormone binding globulin, which allows the testosterone to run rampant, which blocks the estrogen, which means that they end up with facial hair, weight gain, deepening voice, menstrual cycles that are getting further and further apart. So they're infertile right? But the first thing is the insulin resistance. So when we look at this and we see a flattening here, which is pancreas and liver, well, pancreas and liver work together to balance blood sugars. That should be familiar to you from your anatomy and physiology. We have a flattening over here, which is to the ovary side, 
well, the ovary is what gets the brunt of this. Liver and pancreas are not playing nicely in the sandbox because the diet is not the right, it's not made of the right food choices, but the ovary is what gets the negative spill off. And that means that we have unbalanced hormones. And so as I looked at this client's eye, she's actually got a couple of other markings in here that we're not gonna focus on today, but also told me she is likely insulin resistant. And so we had to talk about diet. We had to talk about lifestyle. We had to talk about eating in the cafeteria at the university is not a good idea. Not if you're trying to be healthy, you're gonna have to walk the two miles to the grocery store because she didn't have a car um, to get fresh food and to get protein that you can bring back to your apartment to cook. You're gonna be cooking on a daily basis. We gotta balance your blood sugars. All right, if we balance the blood sugars, we can reduce the insulin resistance. And if we reduce the insulin resistance, we get the sex hormone binding globulin back where it belongs. That allows the testosterone to drop to where it should be, which allows the estrogen and progesterone to do their job to get everything going so that we can get the FSH and the LH working properly with the ovaries. So it's, it's quite a chain of metabolic events, but in truth, what we saw in her pupils confirmed exactly what I suspected from her labs and from her iridology, from looking at the iris without looking at the pupils. Here we have another example of a flattening. You can see, can you see this flattening here? Actually, we've got lots of flattening in these eyes, lots of flattenings. So um, the right lateral superior, that's in a pancreas zone. The left superior medial is also a pancreas zone. And the inferior medial, this is another pancreas zone. When we're looking at a constitutional iridology map, those are all pancreatic zones, as well as a few other things, right? So I'm just hitting the, the easy ones today. Uh, this client came to me, she's been a client of mine for, for 45 years. She was one of the very first clients I've ever worked with. And she keeps, um, she keeps coming back in periodically when she needs help. She started coming in about, must've been about three or four years ago again you know, they, they come and they go, they come for several and they get feeling good. So they disappear for a few years. And then when things start to fall apart, they come back again and we, we rework things. And so there's always the ebb and the flow. When she started coming back a few years ago, mid sixties, um, she had elevated hemoglobin A1C, elevated triglycerides, elevated cholesterol. Okay. So as we look at her eyes, we see a lot of things in here and we've got all kinds of liver markings in here as well. And we've got um, the suggestion that her liver's really not, hasn't managed her carbohydrates very well for a very long time. And that could be throwing her into the triglycerides. Oh yeah, those are already elevated. And into cholesterol, oh yeah, that's already elevated too. And so we knew from her eyes that, that because her diet had become inadequate, her liver was now behaving as well as it could with the poor foods it was getting, right? And so, um, but we seeing that these flattenings again with pancreas tells us that when we put that with this liver indicator with some other things that we see, it tells us that she almost has to be insulin resistant, which again, the hemoglobin A1C really confirmed. Um, and we started working, we worked really hard. She did a great job for about four months of doing things really well. She was loving it. She dropped about 20 pounds over four months, which is great. She went back to her doctor, had all of her tests redone. She was now completely in the ballpark, totally in the normal ranges with no medications. She was doing herbs diet and lifestyle, right? Beautiful. About a year and a half later, she had a heart attack. Um, in my opinion, heart attacks are rarely from elevated cholesterol. They are mostly from emotional trauma. And she'd had something very very tragic happened in her family uh, with one of her grandchildren. And that triggered a heart attack for her, right? And of course, once you have your heart attack, you're on all these medications, you're now on the medical treadmills, treadmill. So we are now working to help her regain her health and get her to a point where her doctors will say, all right, we can start cutting back on these medications because we see no indication that you need them anymore. So we're working on that that's going to take a while because the doctors do a hugely good job. And I, I don't mean to be painting doctors with this really black tarry brush. Okay. Her doctors have done a great job of making her very fearful. 
And, you know, she knows her nutrition. She, she was a nutritionist for a while. She's uh, got herbal training. She knows her stuff, but now she's afraid that if she, if we get her feeling too good and we take the meds uh, and the doctors take the meds away, that she'll have another heart attack. So we've got a lot of work to do, a lot of work to do. All right. So that's the flattenings. Now that's only a few. When we talk about flattenings, we've got ellipses that are vertical, um, oblique and horizontal. We haven't talked about all of those. We've got flattenings. If you think of a stop sign, we can have top and bottom, side and side, and the angles as well. We haven't talked about all of those. We just don't have quite enough time to do all of that. So the Dynamic Iridology Assessment System Program is, will, for those of you who are, how many of you are practitioners? How many of you are working with clients on some level? If you are, just raise your hand. You know, maybe you're a herbalist or a nutritionist. Maybe you're a registered nurse and you're you're going into the nurse practitioner role. Morgan is working with clients. Congratulations, Morgan. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so what you will find iridology do, and Andrea too, good job, is that iridology will help you to assess your clients more quickly without you feeling rushed and without them feeling like you're rushing them. If anything, because you're able to laser in on particular aspects very, very quickly, it makes your client feel more like they're being understood. Iridology will help you to be more accurate and give you better and faster rapport. And it will eliminate the need for an intake form. You will always need a signed release form. But these three and four and five page questionnaires are, in my humble opinion, a waste of time. Right? They ask so much general information that I can get faster and better by asking my clients questions, by having a conversation. And I think that's really important, right? That our clients, again, know we care enough to talk to them. The Dynamic Iridology Assessment System um, for Health Professionals, the only live online fully mentored course for nutritionists, herbalists, naturopaths. I want you to read that as people who have a college level anatomy and physiology course under their belt. As a registered nurse, you had to do a &P. If you've, uh, for example, here in, in Canada, if you've attended the Canadian School of Natural Nutrition and you've got your, your uh, diploma from them, you've done anatomy and physiology and that will count. You know, if you've done a herbal program that had a good a &P course in it that was at least 60 instructional hours, that will count, right? As long as it was a separate part of the curriculum. And this course, the dynamic iridology system is for anyone who wants to streamline their clinical work without sacrificing client care. And I could say while enhancing client care beyond your wildest imagination. What I know happens here, um, Morgan, what about holistic midwifery? Um, you've had to do A and P, right? Then you're eligible. As long as you've got, can show anatomy and physiology on as a separate item on a transcript or that you are licensed. Okay, if it's a medical profession that's licensed, that counts as your A and P. Okay, so hopefully something in there fits where you're at, Morgan. What I've seen is too many nutritionists, herbalists, naturopaths see the client for the first time, gather all kinds of data, then they go off and spend two or three or four hours creating a protocol and a fancy report to bring back to their client, but they're usually not charging enough to cover for all those hours of homework they've done. So with iridology, the way I teach it, you are able to do the assessment, the intake, the assessment, the protocol creation, all in 75 minutes or less. And actually you can probably do it in about 20, which leaves you 40 minutes plus to create rapport, right? And because you are creating the program very quickly and very succinctly, it allows you then to literally create the program step by step by step. You never want to give your client that whole list of 24 things they need to do because they won't do any of them. And then they get no results. And then they don't come back. And worse yet, they tell everybody that you don't know what you're doing. Oh yeah, I went to see her, but I couldn't do the program. Right. But if you use iridology the way I teach it, you won't spend all that extra time creating protocols. You will create programs that are simple and succinct. You'll be able to choose the two or three most important things for your client to be working on right now. And that's not alkalize the diet because that's about 17 things right there, 
right? You'll be able to literally pick the two or three things, a couple of supplements, easy, compact, tightly, tightly packaged that your client can go work on for the next month. And, and you can tell them what they will expect. You know, you're not going to be a new person in a month, but from this program, I expect we are going to see such and such happen. And when they see that, they go, darn, that Andrea, she knows her stuff, right? She gave me this tight little program and she told me I'd see this change and I'm seeing it. I need to go back to find out what the next step is, right? And because that success engenders trust, which means they want to keep coming back that creates long-term compliance and success and long-term retention. Like I, you saw clients, um, I've had some clients since, since I started working in this 45 years ago, right? I've got so many third generation clients now. It's, it's, it's just fun. It makes me giggle when I've got a third generation client coming in, right? Because I took care of the grandma while she was having the mom. And now I get to take care of the babies, right? It's so fun, so fun. So the next go around, of dynamic iridology is starting on June 27th. The class time will be 4 p.m. Pacific. You can see all the different times listed there. The only way you, um, that's gonna sound really harsh. Let me try to rephrase that. Registration is through a private conversation with me. And that's important because I want to know, I wanna know that you've got the anatomy and physiology right? That's important. You don't get in if you don't have proof of that A and P because I go deep. A lot of iridology teachers teach markings. I teach integration. So you learn the markings, then you learn how the markings play off each other because you've got your anatomy and physiology. We can go deep like that. And then we talk about your background. So maybe you're a herbalist. Well, what herbs would you use in this situation? Maybe you're a nutritionist. What nutrition would you use? Maybe you're a physical therapist. What would you do for physical therapy for this? So we start in the class, getting you to integrate what you already know with what you're seeing in their eyes, with what the client wants help with so that you're creating a package for them. Step-by-step, step, you're actually creating a new lifestyle for them. Step-by-step step, that will help them achieve their health goals in a very manageable way. Right. And so that's why we want to do a one on one interview. I need to know you've got the A&P and I need to know that we're going to work well together. Right. You get to vet me just as much as I get to vet you. Right. You get to decide, can you work with me? And I get to decide, can I work with you? I get to decide, will this person's energy work well with the other students that we that we've got enrolled? And if it's all yes, is all the way around, then I will invite you to enroll. If there's something there that's not quite right, maybe you don't have the A and P or you've got some, but it's not enough. I might coach you instead to go and grab this A and P class over here. And when that's done, let's meet again and let's get you enrolled then, right? Or, you know, if, if you're wanting to do this completely virtually, you know, we'll have a conversation that says it's almost impossible to do this well virtually, right? Because you can't get the good eye photos that you would get if you were taking them yourself. So the goal of the call is to make sure that the course is a good fit. I don't want your tuition money if this is not going to be a good fit for you. So important to me. It does nobody any good when a student drops out, right? Nobody. This is Michelle Davis. She came to me trained beyond trained. She had so many credentials from herbology. She had several different iridology certifications from different schools and some of them very well respected. She said, I wanted, I asked her, why did you take my course? I wanted the latest information from an experienced practitioner that has used iridology in nutritional practice for a long time. Having my classroom at home, because it's a virtual program, right? It's online, just like we're doing now, allowed me to have all my charts and books by my side and made it easier. And having an awesome sharing and caring teacher made it the best. Judith helped me better my nutritional iridology practice. I recommend her courses to everyone. Fantastic. Love that. Love that. Stephanie Morgan um, came to me, she has a master's degree in, in education. So I asked her, why did you take my course? She said, I'd seen enough of instructors online to know you were the best teacher, the way you organize info, check for understanding and coach students. Other instructors know their stuff, but you have the heart of a teacher. I wanted to graduate with understanding, not just knowledge. And then she went on to say, I just have to praise my teacher for a minute. 
those of you who know Judith from videos already recognize she's an, an amazing instructor. What you may not realize is that students and graduates have access to Judith and training videos and alumni even after the class is finished. She's a rare find in under promise and over deliver. I'm so thankful I was led to her website. And then we've got lots of my other students agreeing with her down here. That's fun. That's fun. So what's included in the course? This is important to know. The course is 22 and a quarter to two and a half hour long live interactive webinar classes. Now, kind of delivered like we're doing right now, except that you have your cameras on and you have your microphones on. It's important for me, if, I, if my students are comfortable with it, for them to have their cameras on, I want to watch their faces to watch for the clues that are telling me, yeah, this is making sense or no, that went totally the wrong way. I need to reteach that concept, right? That's important. I watch those facial clues. We have, uh, we meet once a week, just once a week. So it's not a huge time commitment, but it's for 20 weeks, right? So it's, it's actually coming out to be 45 to 50 hours of live instruction. Then we have two extra one hour group mentoring se sessions per month. You can attend them if you want. You don't have to, if you don't want to. If you've got a question, if you're working on a case, if you've got a business question, that's what these are for. You don't have to have a question to come. You can just come and hang out and listen. And that's perfect. We love it if you do that too. The textbook that I wrote is 225 pages. It's illustrated, full color, digital, downloadable. It's only available to my students. I've been asked by other people, if I would, other instructors, if I would sell them my textbook, the answer is no. The reason for that is, um, yeah, I'm a little bit of a control freak. No, I'm just kidding. Um, the reason for that is periodically as I'm reading through the textbook, working with the textbook with my students, I'll see something that, even though we've done like 12 edits on this thing, that doesn't, still doesn't feel quite perfect. And so I will actually rework that. And then I will make the new version of the textbook available to all of my students, past and present, for free. You can just download, download a new copy with the corrections in it or with the edits in it, right? I don't know anybody else that does that. Uh, 45 pages of cheat sheets, downloadable, digital again. This is your kind of Coles notes, Cliff's notes, whatever the notes that the abbreviated notes were that you got in high school. You have access to the recordings of your class sessions and of the mentoring sessions. So if you can't make a class, not a big deal. It's recorded. Come and watch it tomorrow. See what everyone was talking about, right? We have small class sizes, no more than 10 students per class. And I do that on purpose. My, when I was in university, I was going to be a school teacher. And I was this close to graduating um, as an elementary school teacher. And I decided I didn't like other people's kids quite well enough. But, uh, and, and that's nothing against children. I have seven of my own and they've all survived. So that's a good thing. And so, but I've realized that I love teaching adults, which is why I've been teaching adults for decades now, right? I love that. But I also know that the best learning happens when students feel comfortable asking questions. And most students are intimidated. Most people are intimidated if there's too many people in the group. So I keep the group small so my students can ask questions as they have them. And my only rule in the class is there's no such thing as a stupid question, right? If you have the question, it needs an answer. And I also include the, uh, uh, the required mentoring from the International Iridology Practitioners Association to fulfill their certification preparation, okay? So whether you want to certify or not, it's there for you, um, but it is required. And I have to, I have to vouch and say that you have had all the appropriate mentoring to prepare for the final exam. All right. Any questions so far about anything we've talked about the course or the iridology stuff we did, the pupil stuff we did today, anything in there that you need more information on? So again, I'm going to encourage, I'm going to encourage, I'm going to use really bad language. I didn't mean to do that. I meant to copy that. Um, I am going to reshare that link and I, I am going to encourage you, if you are considering learning iridology and you want to learn it at a deeply professional level, I'm going to suggest book a call. So Andrea, a little intimidated. Mm, love that. Love that. I do. I really do. Andrea, we haven't spoken yet, have we? Mm, I've been having a lot of these one-on-one uh, -on -one calls lately. I'm going to suggest 
grab that link. Let's do a call. If you're serious about learning iridology, I would love to chat with you and not to try to talk you into anything or out of anything, but to give you the information you need so that you can see if it's a good fit, right? If you've got a college level anatomy and physiology program under your belt already, right? 60 hours of instructional time is what we're looking for. Then book the call, book the call and let's have a conversation right on. So for any of you who haven't already had a one-on-one -on -one call with me, grab that link. Let's do it. If you've had a call and you, maybe it was six or eight months ago or a year ago, and you're now ready to talk about enrolling, book a call, right? Let's have that Zoom meeting. Let's see where you're at. Again, the goal is to make sure it's a good fit for you. I seriously, and this isn't meant to discourage anybody, but I would say that out of all of the people I speak with, at least half of them, I have to send to an anatomy and physiology course first, right? And so there's no shame in that. It's good to know what you need. It's good for us to see what you've got and what you need to make sure you come into this course well prepared to be successful. My only goal is for you to be successful with this. That's the goal. And that's what Veronica was saying earlier when she uh, shared that lovely, uh, that lovely little accolade earlier on. The goal is your success. Alrighty. So with that, my friends, I hope to have calls with many of you this week to get you ready for the June 27th start date. That would be very exciting. And yeah, I hope you have a brilliant day. The replay for this will be going out tomorrow because I usually get them out the day after the event. And so, you know, if there's anything you want to go over again with the pupils, um, you can. But again, we just lost the, the very, very surface here. We didn't go deep. We can't go deep in these because I don't know what your background is, right? We go much deeper in the course, obviously. So with that, I hope you have an amazing, amazing rest of your day. And I really look forward to speaking with you really soon. Have a great one. Bye for now.